Many of you would be familiar with the story of Icarus, if you're not. Uh, it's from Greek mythology. It's, you may have heard the term, don't fly too close to the sun, and that's where that phrase comes from. But Icarus was the son of Daedalus, and Daedalus was an inventor. But he got put in prison. This is all myth, but he got put in prison by the gods, and he wanted to escape. So he created for himself and his son these wings made of wood and feathers and wax, and Icarus was the first to fly, and he flew off and flew higher and higher. He got very confident in his wings. He got really, really high, and in Greek mythology, the sun is quite close to the earth, and so he started getting really hot, and the wax on the wings started to melt, and slowly the feathers started to fall off, and eventually all he was left with was this wooden frame as he soared above the ocean, and naturally, he plummeted, and he plummeted to his death. Icarus flew too close to the sun. That's the common saying as well. He was too confident in his safety. He dismissed the warnings of his father and he paid for it dearly. And today we're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians and we're going to be looking at chapter 10. And in chapter 10, Paul gives some warnings from God about our presumption of safety and our confidence that we can sort of live with one foot in the world and one foot at the foot of the cross and be fine. But, that's, but Paul's going to actually challenge that idea. He's going to ask us to recontextualize the warnings that are given to Israel in the Old Testament and apply them to the church. And in those warnings, he's going to ask us to flee from temptation, to flee from idolatry, and to devote ourselves wholly to our merciful and kind and loving God. So we're going to look at four ideas from this passage. Uh, and we're going to apply them to ourselves this morning. The first idea that we're going to look at is the perils of presumption. Uh, like Icarus, we are so tempted to believe that we're secure because of what we have done, who we are, the apparent blessings we have received, but disconnected from the faith and commitment to Christ. The second idea is we're going to look at how the nation of Israel served as a paradigm for how God interacts with the church. So, He's going to show how he had disciplined the, um, Israel, and that, that likewise he disciplines the church. And this is going to serve as a humble warning for us that we can learn from the people of Israel and see how God treated them and apply that to ourselves. The third idea is we're going to look at the danger and the power of temptation. Humans are incredibly prone to idolatry. We are so easily tempted. We are so susceptible to temptation but we'll see that Paul gives us hope about this temptation. He's going to give us hope in this passage that we can endure under temptation of any degree. Finally, we're going to see that Paul is encouraging us to be solely gods. We can't be both engaging in idolatrous practices and remain worshippers of God. We can't have feet in both courts. There is no room for syncretism in God's kingdom. So let's turn to chapter 10 and see how Paul fits all of this together. I'm not going to read through the whole passage this morning because it is long, but I'll try and deal with each part as we go. We will read it in full, just in sections as we go through. But the first point is that there is this peril of presumption. Paul wants his Corinthian audience and, and us to realize that there's great danger in thinking that because you have seen blessing, you've tasted of God's goodness, that, you, that because of that you might believe that your place is secure, because you've seen and experienced things. Look at verse 1 through 4. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So this passage we're looking at this morning is filled with Old Testament allusions. And so I think it's really relevant that we just finished up a series looking at the fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. And for those of you that don't know the story after Jacob, what happened was the 12, the 12 sons of Jacob, they ended up in Israel, all their families were there, they started breeding, and the Egypt's got a bit worried about that. They started multiplying like crazy. And so they became too powerful, so the Egyptians enslaved them. And 400 years later, God raised up Moses to free them from captivity, to 
bring his people out of slavery. And this is considered a pivotal moment in Israelite history. Uh, Sylvia Kismat says that the major formative in Israelite um, history was the Exodus. They were transformed from slaves into their own people, a people chosen by God. So these allusions that Paul is making to the Old Testament all are are sort of mostly within one story, and that's the story of the escape from Egypt, the the wilderness episodes they're often called. The first allusion is to under the cloud. Uh, He says that um, yeah, they were under the cloud. This is a reference to Exodus 14, chapter, Exodus chapter 14, verse 24. This is a cloud that God sent to lead the people of Israel through the wilderness to the promised land. And this cloud served as this constant reminder of God's goodness, his presence, his guidance, and his care for the people of Israel. And the second allusion is to the Red Sea. Uh, Most of you would be familiar with the Red Sea episode. That one's very uh, popular. In that episode, the Israelite people are up against the Red Sea, getting about about to be murdered by Pharaoh and his people. But God opens the sea and they walk through on dry land. And what's striking about this is that Paul ties these Old Testament narratives to the sacrament of baptism, which we still practice today. He says... All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's drawing a clear parallel between the Israelite experience in the Exodus and the Christian experience in the New Covenant. So those who are baptized into Moses are those who are saved through faith and baptized into Christ. In the same way that the the episode of the Red Sea pointed to Christ and that Christ died, went under, came up um, in a similar way. So Paul is arguing that when Christians are baptized into Christ, we're proclaiming our faith and our commitment to following his teachings. So the story of Israel serves as a type for, or a model for Christians. You know, like, so for example, you know, you know the story of the cloud and the sea. But do you know that they pointed to you? That's what he's saying to the Corinthians. And he doubles down on this point in verse 3 with even more allusions. He says, And they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. There's two more references to the Exodus experience. This is going to be a common theme throughout this morning. It's just that Paul is constantly pointing people back to the Old Testament. So there's the spiritual food in the wilderness. This is the manna that God sent from heaven and the quails that he sent with the wind for the people. And there's the spiritual drink. This is the water that God provided from the rock that followed them around in Exodus 17.6. So this is clearly pointing to the Lord's Supper. So we've got baptism and we've got the Lord's Supper that Paul is pointing to. And the people of Israel ate this spiritual food and they drank that spiritual drink. They tasted of God's blessing. They saw his miraculous and providential works. They experienced his presence in the cloud. And in a similar fashion, the people of Corinth might have tasted the spiritual food. They took communion. They drank of the spiritual drink. They drank the wine. But Paul takes us even a step further. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So Paul's highlighting the divine provision. God is with the people of Israel. He's there. He's tangible. They're seeing him, and Christ is that source of that sustenance. They had truly tasted of God's goodness. And so I think most reasonable Israelites would have assumed that their place in the, in the promised land was secure, right? But look at verse 5. Nevertheless, with with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The people of Israel had been given so much, but they rejected him, and they rejected his promises. At the precipice of receiving the promised land, they rejected his promises and were left to wander, killing most of them. So Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, you may have had experiences just like the Israelites had. You may have been baptized into Christ. You may drink and eat of the Lord's Supper. You may have even experienced an encounter with God. But don't miss the point. They have seen and tasted of God's blessing, and they may assume that they are with God. But Paul's warning applies to them just as much as it applies to us. 
the fact that you've been baptized, the fact that you take communion every week, the fact that you affirm the right theology or that your wife or your husband or your parents affirm the right theology, you might have prayed the sinner's prayer. These blessings don't have bearing on your standing with God if they are disconnected from faith. The lesson is clear. Spiritual privileges do not replace the the need for ongoing faith and obedience. Just because you've received these blessings doesn't mean you're saved apart from faith. Just like the Israelites, the Corinthians were making the same mistake. This leads to our second point. Paul is calling us to actually listen to the lessons of the past. The people of Israel serve as a paradigm for the church. How God treats Israel models how he treats the church in the new covenant. He says in verse 6, Now these things took place as an example. A better word maybe is paradigm or a formative model for us that we might not desire or crave evil as they did. His point is that these stories are not just an example for the sake of the Christians, and so they, they serve as the model or they prefigure God's disposition to the church. And so Paul's concerned that the people of Corinth are on the same path that Israel was on. So he points to four different stories in Israelites in the Israelite history. Uh, first, verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is the most infamous case of idolatry in the Old Testament, the case of the golden calf. They made a calf out of gold and worshipped it, sort of like giving credence, uh, giving it the, the credit for bringing them out of Egypt when it was the God of the Bible who brought them out. And the Corinthians might be surprised at this allegation, right? We saw in chapter 8 that... Paul was concerned about them entering and wasn't too worried about the food that was sacrificed to idols. They've rejected the very idea of other gods in chapter 8. They they, they don't think there is other gods apart from the God of the Bible. But we'll see in verses 19 and 20 that Paul argues that individuals who verbally deny the existence of other gods can still become idolaters through their actions, even though they consciously reject the very notion of other gods. Participating in certain behaviors can make one guilty of idolatry regardless of their subjective intentions. So Paul's second exhortation in verse 8 is this. He says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. He points to Numbers 25. There, the Israelites engaged in sexual immorality with the Moabite women and then participated in idol worship. So God's anger was uh, kindled and 23,000 died of a plague. What's also noteworthy is that this incident in Numbers, I think, demonstrates a tendency, and most of the commentators agree, that sexual immorality leads to idolatry. Kemper and Rosner, two commentators, argue that Paul is quoting this passage to demonstrate a point. He's he's arguing that idolatry tends to follow a lack of self-restraint with respect to the appetites of the stomach and the libido. So so where the stomach goes or where the go, uh, that's where your heart goes. So Paul is calling for them to exercise self-control, to be disciplined and deal with their sexual sins, to take like to take a lesson from the Israelites and remain faithful to their God. Like, look at what, how bad Israel had it when they went against God's will and, and learn from that. It's calling them to avoid compromise, which then leads to further compromise, which leads to further compromise, which leads to idolatry. So Paul's third warning in verse 9 is that we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. This one's a bit harder to understand. Um, It's probably referencing Numbers 21, where the Israelites spoke out against God, criticizing him for the food he had provided. At that point, God had only provided the manna in the wilderness, which is like this flaky stuff that came from the heavens, and they would collect it each morning, and it made this sort of bread. But I can can sympathize with this. That would have got a bit boring, I think, eating bread day in, day out. But the people complained. They, They tested God, so he sent them quail. But... We read verse, uh, Psalm 78, it references this event. 
Uh, the psalmist says that they tested the Lord by demanding the food that they craved, provoking him through their idolatry. And so I think the parallel to the Corinthian church is fairly clear when we understand it that way. If we remember in, the, in like, I think it was chapter 6, where the Corinthians were eagerly enforcing their right to eat whatever they wanted, even if it meant participating in meals associated with idols or, uh, or um, causing others to stumble. Actually, it was chapter 8. I don't chapter 8. Anyway, Paul is saying that the Corinthian church are putting, the, putting God to the test. They're testing God's patience by meddling with things that are not okay to meddle with. Paul finishes up his exhortations in verse 10. Nor grumble, as some of them grumbled and were destroyed by the destroyer. Anyone who's read the Old Testament would know that Israel was notorious for grumbling. It doesn't take long for them to start grumbling in the wilderness. And... Uh, And Paul's going to get a lot of grumbling from the Corinthian church from this letter, I think he suspects. I think he's getting ahead of the grumbling. I think when he sends this letter, they're going to read it. They're not going to be happy with what he has to say to him. And so what he's essentially telling them is, you may not like what you hear, but this is God's word. Deal with it. But Paul doesn't just rebuke them, thankfully, or call them out. Instead, he does what he tends to do when when he's calling out sin, is he highlights the sin, calls out the the error, but then he points to their future eschatological hope. So he's saying that, look at what you are going to live like in the future and live like that today. So he's, he's, he's trying to use future hope to impact current lifestyle. He says in verse 11, Now these things happen to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. His whole point of this chapter so far has been to highlight the fact that they stand at the intersection of the ages. They live in the tension of the already and the not yet. On on one hand, they've already entered into the kingdom of God through Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection. Believers have entered into the kingdom of God. On the other hand, we, we still await for Christ's return and the consummation of all things. We still live in a fallen and broken and hurting world. It's marked by suffering. It's marked by temptation. It's marked by sin and death. And so there's this tension of, well, we, 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 we've entered into the kingdom, but there's still so much difficulty to life. And Paul's point is that we may have seen and received the blessings of the new age, so the joy of fellowship the gift of baptism, the communion of the saints with Christ in the Lord's Supper. But the journey isn't over. We're still susceptible to the same temptations of pride, idolatry, complacency that led to the downfall of the Israelites. So this leads us to our third point, that Paul is warning us about the power of temptation. As humans, we are all highly susceptible to idolatry. I think we're incredibly easily tempted and prone to giving into these temptations. Look at verse 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. Paul is once again calling out the strong. We've seen these strong uh, come up throughout our series It's those who think they have a really clean conscience, who think that they're morally upright when they can engage in unwise conduct. And they believed that they were confident. They they thought they were incredibly wise and spiritually secure. Um, They thought they had nothing to fear from eating at the tables of idols or engaging in sexual immorality. But if they miss the whole point of verses 1 to 12, he makes it incredibly clear now. Look at Israel. Look how easily they fell into idolatry and sexual sin. That was, that was one of the first things that happened the second Moses leaves. The calf episode is, as soon as Moses walks away from the people of God, immediately they're in sin. Paul's saying, look how prideful they were, but look how you are also susceptible to that pride. There's this universal tendency towards idolatry that is just the mark of fallen humanity. John Calvin famously has said that the human heart is an idol factory. Even if there's not idols around, we will make an idol out of something. We have this innate tendency to take what God has made, which is good, and make it into an idol. 
We're so prone to turning things like career, love, sex, possessions, social connections, um, even family, and turning them into idol things. Things which drive our lives, motivate our decisions, and in the case of the Corinthian church, cause others to stumble. They were idolizing things and causing others to stumble through their idolatry. And Paul wants the Corinthian church to realize that their behavior is indicating that they should not be as secure as they believe. They need to reassess their current attitudes and and their current practices. They may not even realize that they're being tempted to idolatry. Nevertheless, Paul is calling to them to resist that temptation. So he calls it out for what it is. It's idolatry. But he gives them a comforting word. Look in verse 13. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There's a few things to note from this verse. Firstly, God is faithful. He reminds us that we are not alone in this battle of temptation. We're not this lonely warrior standing in this gap as this horde charges for us. We, we have God on our side. Secondly, it says that he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. This verse has been, I think, misapplied and misunderstood by a lot of commentators and a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of people take it to, to mean that God will never allow us to face temptations that are difficult to overcome. I think any Christian can attest that that's untrue, right? There's some, some temptations are really hard. And it's, so it's good to acknowledge that because I think pretending that they're not difficult makes us feel all the more guilty and all the more defeated when we fail. This should have been a breeze, but I failed. That's so crushing. But we also see that there's this overemphasis on personal and individual ability that some people have, have claimed, right? That is just our willpower, our innate willpower, our chutzpah. It's not in and of itself. That, I don't think that's enough to resist temptation. I think we, we have this comfort. We have the Holy Spirit. We have an advocate to support us in these times of need. He gives us grace. And he gives us, like, he, he builds us up. Um, yeah, so it's not just our strength that we rely on. It's the Holy Spirit that we can rely on. But Paul does hold people to a standard. I think the implication that he gives is that these temptations are resistible. Not all the Israelites fell. In each case in the Old Testament, some were able to resist. In some cases, it was like two guys, but um, it was, they still were, some were able to resist. Thistleton remarks that God always provides his people with a choice and with an exit path. God is faithful. There's no temptations that are beyond our ability. And this, that's, that's a sign of his faithfulness to his people. I think, in, I think in some situation, God may, in his divine provision, remove us from the situation, maybe even before we even know there's a situation, right? We may not realize that we're on a path to temptation, but God prevents the situation. Those are really nice when that happens, but others, he gives us the strength to endure under temptation. I think that one of the most astounding resources that God has given to facilitate this resisting temptation is the church. If we look at Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So in that context, I can't fathom why some Christians neglect to gather with their fellow brothers. There is no greater resource for resisting sin, for resisting temptation, for growing as a believer than the community of other believers empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul, in his letter to the church in Thessalonica, says, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. It's, it's building each other up to resist temptation. I think that's just the, the beauty of the church. So it baffles me when people don't visit with their brothers and sisters in DGs or church or just catching up. There's no better way to build each other up. And so God doesn't leave us to our own devices to struggle against temptation. He gives us both his spirit and his church that we might resist because God is a faithful God. No temptation is beyond yours 
or mine overcoming. So this leads to our final point. We are called to be solely gods. We can't be both idolaters and worshippers of God. There's no room for feet in both courts, no room for syncretism in God's kingdom. Look at verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I, what I say. Paul has just encouraged the people of Corinth that there is no temptation beyond their ability to resist, right? In particular, it seems that Paul is most concerned about their idolatrous actions. Like he's worried that they're engaging in, um, in idolatry. So he says, flee from idolatry. There's this, this sense of imminent danger in Paul's words. Thistleton again said that this terminology conjures up the image of a crowd caught in a narrow gorge and that like urge to flee at the like at absolute speed. I think um, Camper and Rosner also mentioned that, that this highlights the Red Sea episode, doesn't it? Like it's this idea of the Israelites trapped against the sea and they, they got to flee from the people of um, Egypt. That's, that's how we should feel about temptation and sin, is, is to flee it, not dip our toes in, dabble. Because um, Paul, so Paul's concerned for his people. He wants, his urgency can't be understated in this passage. Um, it's, it's just, he's so concerned. For, these are his friends. Like, these are the people that he spent months, years ministering to, loving, caring for. And he sees this pathway that they're on, and he's horrified for them. He wants to, he, he's calling them to, flee. And so he appeals to their pride in a sense. He calls them sensible people. They, we've seen throughout this, this um, book that they thought themselves pretty clever. They were very wise. They were very sensible. They were very, you know, prudent. Um, so he says, look how, look how sensible my position is. Be wise. Be discerning about what I'm about to tell you. If you're so smart, figure this out. And so he's going to prove how unwise, how foolish it is to enter into idolatry. And he's going to use a model of the Lord's table uh, to prove his point. So look at verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participation, participants in the altar? I think we need some, some cultural context to, to really understand Paul's argument. In the Greco-Roman world, sharing a meal was often laden with religious significance. Whether at a temple or at someone's house, there was often idols involved uh, in the process of having a meal. So in household idols, you would often put one at the end of your table or just on a little niche next to the table uh, and it would be prominently displayed for everyone to see. And much like how we save grace or give thanks to God for, for the food when we're about to eat, um, meals often in, involved an invocation of the deity just before you would eat. Uh, they would give a little oil or a little wine to the idol and offer a prayer or a petition um, and then throughout the meal, it was customary to direct your attention to the idol, giving, giving thanks to it or asking for things or um, just giving additional prayers. So what these invocations of these idols sort of facilitated was the sense in which uh, the people gathered around the table were dining with the idol or dining with the God represented by the idol. So they were giving, in a sense, credence to the claim that these gods were real in a sense. They were worthy of prayers and petitions. And so Paul, uh, so the, like the Christians recontextualized this idea um, as they, they grew in the church. So, you know, when, they, when we take the Lord's Supper, there's a sense in which we too declare our allegiance and our communion with God. There's a sense in which when we eat, we, we eat with God, we eat with Christ through the Spirit. And the, the reformers went a bit further and said that we dine with Christ as we take communion. In any case, this act symbolizes our participation in his body and his blood, and it reaffirms our covenant relationship with him and his, our unity with his church. Like when we eat communion, we eat together and we, we represent the body of Christ um, who is in amongst us. So, in a similar way, 
when the Corinthians were eating with idols, they were some symbolically participating in worship of that idol. Just as they worshipped God at the Lord's Supper, then they were going and worshipping a foreign deity at breakfast the next day. Um, so they may in their own heart not believe that these gods were real. They may not have been uttering prayers or giving offerings themselves. But by participating in this food, in this context, they were sharing in a religious experience and implying at least partially or tacitly allegiance to that idol. So they were, they were saying that I can be both allied to this idol and allied to God at the same time. They were compromising the exclusive, like, like the covenant with Christ is exclusive. Um, Paul's not contradicting himself. In chapter 8, we saw that food offered to idols has no real spiritual significance. It's not contaminated food. Um, but look at verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord, of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul's point here is not that the food is contaminated, but by engaging in these spiritual practices, these meals, the believers are splitting their allegiance. And he highlights that there's real spiritual significance in this conduct. In the West, I think we're desensitized to the, the, the severity of idol worship. There are spiritual forces at work. Um, I don't, we don't understand them, and I don't think we have a, a proper grasp of them um, but we do know that they are actively opposed to the will of God. And I don't think we have time nor the need to go into a long discussion about demons or demonology, but we can see here that there is at least a spiritual aspect of pagan worship that is incompatible with Christian conduct. So Paul is warning them, continued participation in these meals risks dulling their spiritual sensitivity and giving unwitting allegiance to demonic forces. And it undermines their devotion to God. So they're at risk of incurring the wrath of God. That's what verse 21 and 22 says. And the indication here is that even if the Corinthian believer does not believe in the deity they are dining with, they are still engaged in the act of idolatry. They may reject the notion that there's an idol behind that in that room, but still God doesn't tolerate idolatry. He doesn't want his covenant people to dip their toes in with demonic waters. So how do we connect this chapter and passage to idols today? What principles can we put forward together in Australia today? I think it's very rare that we're going to be off, like someone's going to offer us uh, the opportunity to eat with an idol in the room. Um, but there are places in the world that is a common practice. And so be cautious about that when you travel. But we can elucidate some principles that we can apply today, I think. Uh, firstly, I think we need to be cautious about activities or cultural practices that may have deeper spiritual meaning than we're willing to give them credit. Secondly, the principle is that we're called to be the ex to, like we're called to the exclusive worship of God. We can't dip our toes in worshiping or idolizing other things than God. Thirdly, we see that we are accountable to God for our actions. We're called to a life that is utterly devoted to God and building up Christ's church. We can't dabble in conduct that undermines that calling. In terms of concrete examples, I, I want to cautiously throw out a, a couple. Um, and I'm willing to be wrong on a couple of these. You can debate me after if you like. Um, but the first one that I, that I came up with was when I was organizing my honeymoon, I got we went to Bali for our honeymoon, and there was a billion ads for, for like cleansing rituals in, in rivers and up on mountaintops and um, yeah, dealing with the divine, essentially. And I, and I don't see how that's compatible with Christianity. I feel like that's a bit of a gimme, but I would be very cautious about interacting with those things if I was a Christian. A more controversial one, and this one I know is going to get some hot takes, uh, but it's, it's yoga. I'm not I'm not saying that yoga is wrong in all contexts, at all times. This isn't a blanket statement. Um, and I know this has been spoken a lot 
about by a lot of pastors. Um, and I have my opinions, and you're, you're okay to disagree. Um, but I used to work with a professional yogi, and uh, I had some long discussions with her about this. And she certainly taught her class and ran her class on the assumption that uh, this was connecting people with higher powers and it was leading them on a further life of enlightenment. So I think that that's a bit of a, a slam dunk, but, you know, I might be wrong. But I think that, that that's not a blanket statement about the practice of yoga, and I think this applies to idol worship in chapter 8, or food offered to idols. The food isn't compromised, and I don't think bending your body in a particular way is compromised. I think it's in the context of spiritual practice that it's problematic but I'm willing to uh, elucidate uh, or elaborate further if needed. Um, I think we can get caught up in the practice of idolatry with our materialism, and, and especially in contexts where we are interacting with other people. So I think a, a prime example of this that I've seen is the rat race. I've worked at a fairly competitive law firm, and uh, I, like, there was this constant competition to who could have the most luxurious lifestyle, be the most committed to their job, you know, work their way up the corporate ladder fastest. And I think that that, that demonstrates a sense in which you've got your feet in both courts. Um, happy to be challenged on all of these. But I think Paul is, the principle is that Paul is challenging us to examine whether we are wholeheartedly committed to God. Do we dabble in a little bit of idolatry here, just a nibble there, a sip there? But Paul is warning us that there's deeper things at work. He says to be on your guard. Don't tempt the Lord to anger. Don't, don't, just don't play with these sorts of things. I think this is calling on a believer to be wholehearted, to be uncompromising in our devotion to God. It's an unwillingness to syncretize even a little. Um, no matter how compelling or attractive or convenient it may seem. Um, we're called to dine with Christ alone, not with other gods. And this is what we do when we take the Lord's Supper, in a sense. We declare our allegiance to God. We proclaim that through His blood and His flesh, we are made His. Not because we're the most intelligent, not because we have figured out our lives, so we might as well make ourselves worthy, but because He is merciful to us. He's called us out of darkness, just as he called the people out of Israel, of, uh, of Israel out of Egypt, and he's calling us to a higher, uh, to the promised land in a sense. He's made us his by his power, and, and it's his mercy to us which brings us into this family which we call the church, and he's glorified in us when we give him wholehearted devotion. So if you are a believer, if you are marked by God and are His, if you're wholly committed to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come and eat and remember the wonderful grace that God has shown you in His Son. If, you, if you're not a believer, we, we just ask that you would stay seated for this. Um, we believe in accordance with Scripture that this act, this symbolic meal is for believers. Um, but while you're sitting there, consider this opportunity that lies before you. Um, there's an opportunity to be part of God's people, to receive God's mercy, uh, to be made pure and accepted by God, um, to be made holy and forgiven uh, by the work of Christ. Uh, let's pray. We get the band up and pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we are so prone to stumbling, so prone to uh, yeah, going our own way. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, grant us mercy this morning, that you would Help us worship you in fullness to be wholly committed to you, uh, that you would help us be discerning about what is and is not uh, undermining our witness or our faith. Uh, Lord, help us be conscious that we don't tempt you to anger. Uh, yeah, Lord, help us, help us live lives that reflect our wholehearted commitment to you and your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.